I'll face the flag of the greatest country on earth. As we say the pledge, let us be mindful of the sacrifices of our MIAs and POWs. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Madam Clerk, would you call the roll, please? Councilwoman Taylor. Councilman Brooks. Here. Councilman Salafaro. Here, ma'am. Councilman Butcher. Councilman Jackson. Councilman Green. I'm here. And Councilwoman Bowman. Present. Thank you. Uh, tomorrow I will ask for the uh, approval of the uh, administrative conference, city council meeting, and the special meeting March 27, 2023, and March 28, 2023. Uh, at this time, we have awards and recognition and distinguished guests. Any council member have any awards, recognition, or distinguished guests? We're going to more. Anyone else? Uh, Mr. Mayor, do you have any awards or recognition of distinguished guests? I, I do, Mr. Excuse me. I do, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh -huh. Dr. Pam Barker, who's the principal of Louisiana Key Academy, yes, sir. Uh, is here to make a very brief presentation to you, and I think she has Dr. Philip Roseman with her. Okay. First of all, thank you, Mayor, for giving us the opportunity to, to talk about something that uh, we've been working on for the last year, year and a half uh, to bring to this community. I'd like to introduce today to y'all the Louisiana Key Academy. It's going to be a specialty school for dyslexic children. The school will begin this next school year. Uh, it's a charter school. It's a public school. There's no tuition. That's not a minor thing. Uh, my grandson lives in Dallas. Uh, they send him to a school just like this. Uh, it's a private school, and the cost of it is more than we pay for uh, for our colleges here in, in Louisiana. This isn't the first uh, Louisiana Key Academy. It's the third uh, in our state, uh, by, all by the same founder. Uh, we have one in Baton Rouge and one in North Shore. And this is something that we have in Louisiana, special to Louisiana, that unique, uh, something that they don't even have in Texas. Uh, to, to be able to do this. From a doctor's perspective, this is, this is what is so unique about this school. That uh, I think the best way to describe it is with an analogy. And the analogy I'll use is that of MD Anderson and cancer. MD Anderson is a great place to go for cancer treatment, diagnosis, research, all that, but they concentrate on cancer. Uh, and they, they're the best in the world at it. The same is true of this school. Uh, it's a concentration on dyslexia, which is common. Uh, it puts experts together, they work together, they learn from each other, and it deals with the whole child, just like MD Anderson deals with the whole person. Uh, and it brings self-esteem to these children that uh, have trouble reading out loud and, and, and may uh, uh, have some teasing from their friends. Um, dyslexia is a lot more common than I thought it was. Uh, I'll admit I had no idea it was this common. And the way I know it's common is by studies about 20% of the population has it, probably about 10% of the population it has fairly significant dyslexia, and 50% of the jail population uh, has dyslexia. Uh, it's a major education problem. Uh, for literacy, but I think it's also a public safety problem in terms of teaching people how to read and, and having them uh, uh, be useful members of society. Since I've been involved in this effort, I think the most important thing I've got is personal stories. Um, people know that we're involved with this and they tell us their story. And so many of them are heartbreaking, but so many are resilient. Uh, of the people that uh, to, that overcome this. I think the most telling was a day that we presented at a place similar to this at the school board uh, about buying Arthur Circle School. The day before we were talking to the uh, to uh, the realtor for the school system about buying uh, the school in Arthur Circle. 
and she basically talked a little bit about how we were going to make that happen but a lot about the fact that she had dyslexia and how difficult it was for her to overcome it and then she told me the story of her daughter who also had dyslexia who she had seen it overcome it and as a, we went to the school board uh, and talked about this we thought it was going to be about a 10 minute presentation turned into an hour and a half not by what we were saying but by the people on the school board telling their stories about people that they knew family and friends uh, with dyslexia so I have no doubt now uh, for me that it this is a common issue uh, and one that people really struggle uh, to deal with um, and probably the last thing in that meeting was there was another group that was considering buying the school at the same time and they had a realtor there the realtor came and talked and believe this or not more of her conversation was the fact that we really should have this school in this community because her sister could have really used the school uh, and uh, so I think there's there's so many people that are looking forward to it I I'm going to leave the rest of this to, to talk with Pam Barker I just wanted to introduce it as a volunteer and one that believes that this is something that will be in very important to this community uh, just like Amazon just like some of the other things we're doing this will be a great addition to our community Pam thank you dr. Roseman good afternoon um, it's a pleasure to be here I want to thank the mayor uh, for allowing us time to speak and um, for you taking the time to um, listen to this and for all that you do um, for your constituents. Well, as a retired educator, um, having spent most of my educational career working with students with disabilities, I'm thrilled to be part of Louisiana Key Academy and to bring this school here that's specifically designed to work with students with dyslexia. And, um, you know, as Dr. Rosen said, we've been speaking in the community quite a bit, sharing that information. And one of the questions that we're most often asked is, why do you need a school for, just for students with dyslexia? So one of the things that I like to share in answering that question is that I think Dr. Roseman mentioned one in five students have dyslexia. An alarming fact is that only 2% of those students are actually identified with dyslexia. 20% of our population. Um, people with dyslex dyslexia are very bright. Um, there's some misconceptions about that, and we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. But they're slow readers, not slow thinkers. And so we like to share that information as well. Uh, the alarming fact about incarceration, there was a study done very recently um, by the Dyslexia Resource Center out of Baton Rouge and they went into um, Huntsville um, prison system at St. Gabriel and um, six, over 60 percent had some form of dyslexia. The state of Texas did one several years ago and looked at all of their prison system and it was closer to 80 percent. So it's now a societal issue that we really need to address. As I said, there's some misconceptions about dyslexia. Um, and I want to begin, I'm going to read this because it's a formal um, definition of dyslexia and it was enacted back in 2020 by the Louisiana legislator, legislature and I think it's really important that we, we recognize that this is um, on the forefront of, of helping us understand and grasp the magnitude of what we're dealing with. Dyslexia is defined as an unexpected difficulty in reading of an individual who has the intelligence to be a much better reader. It's most commonly caused by difficulty in phonological processing in which the appreciation of the individual sounds of the spoken language affects the ability of an individual to read, speak, and spell. Now with that being said, the good news is that we have some very, very current 21st century scientific evidence and research that explains to us what that really looks like and using that evidence and that scientific evidence to, we call that the merging of science and education. So we're bringing that evidence to the forefront of what we're doing each and every day in the classrooms. One of the things special about Louisiana Key Academy that um, was brought to our attention that, that really was um, 
uh, it's really outlines the, the specialty that they bring to this program. They have partnered with the Yale Center for Dyslexia and Creativity, and it's um, out in Connecticut, and it's founded by Dr. Sally and Bennett Shaywitz. And if you've done any research, they're the leading experts now um, in the field of research. They've been doing this research for many years. Um, and in fact, they've even written a, a very common book that people read, it's called Overcoming Dyslexia. So what will LKA CADO look like? It's definitely a specialized program. Um, it begins with um, screening and evaluations. And um, we know that Unfortunately, not in all cases are students who are struggling with reading are then referred for evaluations for dyslexia or screening. And that's not to be critical of any one or any system. It's just kind of the not, again, recognizing the data and the opportunities and the tools that we have available to use for screening. Um, like I said, the typical screener is not used probably into the second or third grade. We have evidence now that we can use screeners to determine at-risk factors as early as kindergarten. So that's important, and that's being used with Louisiana Key Academy. Um, all screenings, all evaluations are absolutely at no cost. Um, as Dr. Rosen said, in some places, screenings and evaluations can cost thousands of dollars. Um, in addition to the screening and evaluation, we're doing some intensive teacher training. Um, this model is um, utilizing what we call an Islamic, it's the um, International Multi-Sensory Structured Language Council. And again, it's a, a new program that's 21st century evidence-based information on how we can train teachers to use this multi-sensory language approach to help these students who are struggling with dyslexia and specifically with reading. Um, interesting, you know, it sounds sometimes like we're being critical of other programs, but Louisiana, um, unfortunately, our teachers are not coming out of our colleges and universities trained to teach students with dyslexia. But um, good news there is in 2024, Louisiana legislature has is going to be requiring that all colleges and universities have a course specifically um, designed for teaching students with dyslexia, and that will be added into the educational curriculum and program. Um, another special feature of this, this particular program is our evidence-based instruction. Um, there's going to be a full day of specialized instruction. The average class is going to have a 17 to 1 ratio. The small group 90-minute pullout for each student in reading will be at a 6 to 1 ratio. So that's really something very significant that will certainly add that specialized um, help for those students. Um, and as well, if needed, the 90 minutes in a 6 to 1 ratio can occur in math. Um, there's a big focus on student outcomes with constant progress monitoring, and that's designed so that you're looking at those individual skill deficits, you're addressing those deficits, and you're driving that curriculum specifically and individually for those children to remediate those, those areas. Um, you know, as a special educator, I used to say that if you accent our strengths, our weaknesses disappear, and that's really one of the philosophies here is that we accent Dyslexia students are very, very bright. They're critical thinkers. They, are, um, they think out of the box. They're, they're just having difficulty with reading. So can, if we look at those other strengths and their, their high intellectual ability, we use that, accent those strengths, and then work on those reading difficulties, then we're going to have great success. Um, in, in the last few months, in dealing with parents and um, families, I truly, in some of the cases, it's just been heartbreaking. I, I tell someone I have to keep Kleenex on the conference table. But, you know, this program's not just going to change the lives of these children, but it's going to change the lives of these parents who are struggling to help their students, helping to get them <coughs> needing, struggling to get the needed resources. So this is changing the lives of students and families. Um, we'll be opening in the fall of, in August. Um, as Dr. Rosen mentioned in the old Arthur Circle building. Um, 
I want to also mention uh, this is a type two charter, but it's a nonprofit charter. So I think it's important to understand that there's not um, profit being made in any way. It's proved by Bessie. Um, and um, the good news is we can serve students all over this area, not just in Caddo Parish. So our next steps, of course, to get the remodeling done, we want to screen and evaluate those students who may not have been evaluated, um, who are struggling at no cost whatsoever. Of course, we'll provide training. And we also want to be just a resource for parents. Even if your child doesn't need to attend um, Louisiana Key Academy, we can be a resource and guide them to get the support and help and understanding um, what those difficulties look like. So um, I thank you for your time. My ask, our ask today is um, to allow us to be a part of sharing that word with your constituents. I can be available to meet with parents, large groups, smart, small groups, any kind of community event. We want to be there um, so that they can gain an understanding. And, and as I said, this may not be for every student, but if we know that we're reaching those um, that really need it, then we know that we're, we're doing the right thing. So I want to thank you again. I would be remiss without recognizing the Honorable um, Vice Chair Tabitha Taylor. Thank you for all that you're doing to support our students with autism, the awareness and support and education. Um, you're my comrade, my friend, and I appreciate all that you're doing. Any questions? Ms. Barker, I want to tell you congratulations again. They pulled you out of retirement, huh? But they pulled you out of retirement for your passion. I'm happy to see this happen because of just so many individuals that uh, were diagnosed with dyslexia in the school system and that we were limited with what resources that we could actually provide for them. So I think you can count on me for sure for getting the word out because I understand how important it, this, this is, but also changing the face of what individuals think dyslexia is. Because there are a number of adults that are walking around Absolutely. with dyslexia and may not even know it the same way as I tell people that there are many that are on the spectrum and may not know them. We all have some of those characteristics because it isn't physical that you see. Um, and so um, I'm happy to see this happen. I think that it will definitely count, uh, help to condense even some of the behavioral issues that we have Absolutely. when children are dealing with this level of deficiency, but knowing that they have an entire support system. So I'm happy to see you do this, and I'm definitely happy to see you leading the charge. Well, thank you, so and thank right you for the with you again. Oh, God bless you. And you're so, you're, you're correct because what we're seeing in those early years when these children are struggling in kindergarten and first grade, even second grade, they're not getting the resources. And, and it's not being critical of any one or any system. It's very hard to identify and it's very hard to provide interventions and services. And we as educators sometimes look at those children in those early years and we think, well, they haven't been given support at home. Right. Um, maybe lack of language and vocabulary and reading at home, which may not always be true, but right. we just kind of sometimes um, we're subject to provide those excuses and then we want to allow that child to struggle, right. thinking that we're giving them adequate help when all along in those years they're continuing to struggle. Right. Their self-esteem is, is demolished <laughs> in many cases. So um, that's one of the things that was exciting about helping students love, love learning again. Yes. So yes. thank you for your words. I, I'd just like to say thank you all for doing all that you do. Thank you, Dr. Roseman. And also, if you uh, stay in contact with um, Councilwoman Taylor, then I will give her the opportunity to interview you on my uh, radio show oh, so that God. the word can get out so that people will be aware as to what's about to happen because I discovered that there are a lot of wonderful programs and great programs, but if you, the word doesn't get out, then, then it's just lost. So Absolutely. whatever time you need, then she'll be uh, available for. Well, thank you. At no, at no cost, <laughs> no, none cost. Well, in one of the little <laughs> brochures that I gave you. Anything you can do along those lines of informing us what we need to do to communicate to people. Yeah. Uh, because it does no good, like you said, unless mm -hmm. people know that it's out there and there's a possibility of a choice for them. 
Yes. So appreciate very much. Mm -hmm. Anything, call us, call yes. me. <laughs> Leave your number with the clerk. Don't. Okay. Yes, I'm sir. available Saturdays for any type of events that you may have, even if it's small group or large group. There's, there's, there's What's a, the age range. We'll be first through fourth, and when there's a possibility, we'll under we will know in the next week or so we may be even adding kindergarten. Okay. Um, in some of our screenings of older students, we're seeing their siblings that are in that young age, <coughs> so we may be even adding kindergarten. We should know that very soon. We'll increase the Yes, and we're starting, I don't know if we, either one of us said, we're starting with around 160 students. Okay. So, and we're, and we're starting just at that first through fourth grade, fourth grade, but the intention is fifth grade next year, sixth grade, Correct. seventh, That's what going I on asked. up. Good. And before I end, I want to invite you all, um, we're having a little groundbreaking on April 26th at the Arthur Circle Building from 3 to 7. Um, please stop by if you have a chance. Um, there's a lot of information that we'll be sharing there as well. We'll have staff um, from the Dyslexia Resource Center in Baton Rouge to share more information. We'd love to just talk to parents. We're going to have a little area set up in the library so we can kind of give them more specific information, talk to them about their needs or struggles. So this is really a community outreach, and as, as Tabitha said, it's a passion of ours. So let us know what we can do to support you and your community. Councilman Jackson. Yeah, so I'm definitely a huge advocate. Um, my son, Alan, was diagnosed with dyslexia about mm, two years ago now. And, and you're correct. Um, he was given a lot of labels um, as being lazy, not attentive. And it, we were even hard on him as parents, you know, just thinking he wasn't doing his best. Right. Um, but once he got the proper diagnosis, we was able to rule out a lot of things because the parents weren't attentive. We attended every parent-teacher conference, so we were able to rule out a lot of different things that continue the testing um, moving forward. But it's a lot of kids out there that are not getting diagnosed properly because right. they're, they're getting labeled so quickly mm -hmm. as coming from disadvantaged households. Absolutely. Just, just, just a lot of different labels that prevent us from diagnosing correctly. But once he was diagnosed, it was a big weight that was just lifted and then once we were able to give him the right um, training um, you can see his confidence level start to come back immediately and he is completely night and day from um, before he was diagnosed and it changes the lives of parents as it well does. doesn't it, does. it? absolutely it does. well thank you for so sharing you. your words thank you thank you okay so i will see you soon thank you love you <laughs> thank you uh, Mr. Matt, do you have any other uh, business uh, related to the city? Uh, I do not. I, I may recognize Ms. Bonnie Moore tomorrow. This is uh, National Community Development Week. Yes, sir. Uh, but she's not here today. So she's I'm she's, she's here. here. She's, she's over. She's, she's, she's over. Oh, I can't. <laughs> well, then I would like to call Ms. Moore up. Yeah. I can't see her. <laughs> While she's coming up, the City of Shreveport will recognize the Community Development Block Grant Program and the Home Investment Partnerships during <coughs> National Community Development Week this week. And it aims to bring education awareness to the vital work funded by these programs, which is already underway during in our city. And uh, Ms. Moore, if you don't mind letting us know kind of what the activities for the week are going to be. Okay. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, we're recognizing Community Development Block Grant Week across the country uh, through the National Community Development Association. Uh, part of what we do is uh, just let the community know about what we do, how much we've infused into the community, um, how much dollars that are being brought to our community as an investment into many of our neighborhoods and many of our low to moderate income persons. On tomorrow, we'll have a meet and greet at the Milan Street Kitchen Incubator from 11 to 1. Uh, during that time, we will uh, show you how we spend our dollars, what we spend our dollars on. Uh, we'll get an opportunity to talk to the community, let them meet the community development staff. Many people see me and, and a few others as the face for community development. There's a whole litany of people that work toward making our community a better place. And we certainly want the community to be able to meet those people and talk to them, ask them questions, ask us questions about what we do, how we do it, and why we do it for our community. Our, our uh, pro signature program, and we host this each year in different parks throughout the city, is called CDBG Park Day. 
This year we'll be having it at David Rains Community Center. It'll start at 3 o'clock p.m. The community is invited, not just the MLK community or District A, but anyone throughout the city of Shreveport. This, the kids will get an opportunity to have fun and also uh, anybody that comes will learn about our programs. We'll provide information as well. Uh, it is a tremendous opportunity to just uh, engage with the community and also let the community know about the good work that we're doing. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Any other business? With that, that's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Um, Not till I'm out of town, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, at this particular time, we will have property standards. Mr. Green. status update on Forest Oaks apartments on David Rains Road? Are they going to, have they received their letter? Will they be entering into environmental court? I'll send you an email on it. I don't have the status with me right now. Okay. Anyone else? Good. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, revenue collection plan implementation report. Uh, master plan report, Mr. Clark. You have any reports today? Mr. Chair, I never give up an opportunity to come and talk very briefly about master planning. Uh, me and some of the staff are just returning from the American Planning Association Conference in Philadelphia, where we did a whole lot of uh, study and interacting between planners from around the country on what's about to happen here in Shreveport. As you well know, we are going through an updating process of our master plan, and this is going to give us an excellent opportunity to address some of the concerns <coughs> that have been expressed by you and some of the concerns that have been expressed by the citizens and business people of our community. Uh, we're very excited. I think that uh, we are about to get the RFPs in so that we can do the evaluation of the consulting firms that have submitted to uh, take on this project. And once we get that process started, we have very high expectations that finally we're going to be able to get into uh, comprehensive neighborhood planning that will allow us to truly study the neighborhoods around the city of Shreveport making recommendations for the needs and making recommendations for the improvements and making recommendations for just general impact that make the quality of life in these neighborhoods extreme, much, much better. So I just wanted to come and share that real briefly with you, Mr. Chair, and each time you give me the opportunity, once we get the process going, I'll have an update for you from here on out. Thank you. Um, budget or actual financial report. Public hearings, there's none. Adding legislation to the agenda. Um, do we have any legislation to be added? Not at this time. Thank you. Uh, public comments at this particular time. Uh, you'll be allowed to come and speak. The vice chair will control the uh, time. John Glover. Good evening. John Good evening. Glover, 9100 Walker Road, apartment 217, Shreveport, Louisiana, 71118. I'd like to get clarity on one of your ordinances that are on for second reading and final passage. That's ordinance number 33. I took notes at the March 20, let's see, the 27th meeting that shared some intricacies about that ordinance, but it wasn't clear enough. And even going back over the agenda for today, 
and seeing the dollar amounts that are done, I still see no particulars in the streets that are going to be addressed. And I'd like to know what they are, uh, the districts and the like. If someone could assist me in that endeavor, I would indeed appreciate that. Um, thank you for your time. Ms. Glover, I'll get you a copy of the streets that will be addressed. Thank um, you. Especially as it relates to District E, but I'll give you the whole copy. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Miss um, Sarah, is it Mercer? Miss Mercer. Miss as well as Mercer. Miss Mercer. You have to come to the mic. Oh, I, I and you have to. to you have to address the con the council. Okay, my name is Sarah Mercer, and I got three minutes to tell y'all then. But I'm having trouble reading and speaking because not only has it been discovered that I have autism and had for 66 years despite being a successful educator for 27. And I understand these kids. God, I understand these kids. But because people next door made noise continuously almost three years, my body has compromised my eye. I can hand y'all pieces of paper to look over what I'm trying to say. Okay. You can give it to the clerk. And I'm so sorry, like I said, it turns out I was able to suppress all this for years, but the medicine makes it the medicine is messing me up. I can't just Ma'am, you can just hand everything that you need to us to get to the clerk, please. Sorry, we don't always logically think, Jesus, Maria, I hope they have a clerk. <laughs> I had to rush the city council. Oh, God. Everybody gets one of each. Jesus. Take your time. It's okay. I'm so sorry. It's all right. She, she can do it for Sleep you. deprivation. Hasn't been helping anything. She can do it. Okay. Do it and give me one of each. Thank you, maybe that one. That's the thing. Okay. You'll see there's several scriptures on it and everything because all the social. Miss Mercer, you can come back to the mic. Me? Just address the council. You have to come back to the mic. Oh. After you give her all of that paperwork, then come back to the mic. Okay, then one C and a two C and a three and a four. I'm so sorry. Thank you for your indulgence, as I said. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for the inconvenience to y'all. Miss Mercer. Yes, ma'am. This way. This you way. Have to talk uh, to uh, us this uh, way. <laughs> As I said, one of the things about uh, autism is that we don't operate in the social filters that um, t tend to be the way to do things. We forget or we. Uh, because English is such a complicated language. I can deliver a sentence that will challenge any English actor. However, as I said, it requires so many nuances that are a combination of the different languages. Now, I can still speak my Spanish fluently. I can sing fluently. I can quote from you the Bible, what I have just read. Do as you wish, <laughs> others, but as for me and I, we will follow the Lord. I say I can speak in Spanish. Yo hablo español must be in. But English? Lord, we short down it to quick talk, not, my dear chap, you need to perambulate a little faster because there's an emergency vehicle coming. We say, get out of the road, here comes a fire truck. Right? Right. So forgive me for appearing rather disheveled before you, but the prednisone that I have had to take and then the chemotherapy to fight this autoimmune problem that my body has attacked my left eye, thank God, not the rest of me, as a result of sleep deprivation for over three years, almost every night, has been interrupted with five minutes to 10 minutes sleep in between the people next door who do not sleep between 10 at night and seven in the morning. I'll be right back. So, Ms. Mercer, Ms. Mercer, so let me ask you this. Yes, so you're, you're, you are coming before the council because your neighbors Keep no, a loud noise. No, ma'am. So what's your reason for coming before the council today? I'd like to, uh, let me see. Got my fancy words right here. Um, 
If you look around, you'll see tired people. They're tired from work overload, life's demands, family concerns, health worries, property upkeep, world problems. And at home, they're too tired for their kid interactions, too tired to fix healthy meals, to even wish they could care. Got lots of sightings on that. Sleep deprivation is the greatest threat to our healthy, productive life. Child obesity is also a result of sleep deprivation. REM, or rapid eye movement sleep phase, is, night, is life necessary, also cited in several places. We the people have outlined goals in a petition appointing Sarah Mercer to be spokesperson for many, if not all, the citizens of Shreveport and the incorporate properties to request the following updating of the city ordinances and practices for quiet hour noise control and police empowerment thereof to better serve our city's outdated methods. The noise ordinance in place sto sta states noise between 10 p.m. and 7 a.m. Sunday through Thursday and 11 p.m. to 8 a.m. Friday and Saturday is sound and it must be report sound reported must be audible 50 plus 50 plus feet that's further from that wall to that wall be 15 plus minutes of duration and 15 decimeters above the background sounds. Well, we, the people, request the amounts be reduced to zero, zero noise tolerance levels. And if the noise is overheard clearly, it's too loud. If I go, ah, that is 0.25 seconds, but honey, it just brought you up out of a REM sleep. Not conscious enough to know what's going on, but it jerked you out of REM sleep. REM sleep is no input, so you can like clean your brain like you do your room. So, Ms. Otherwise, Mercer, it's a mess. <laughs> so let me make sure that I understand because your time is up. You want us to take a look at the noise ordinance that the city has, and you would like for it to be changed. Is that the request? We'd like it to zero. We would like perpetrators of the noise to also be required, uh, the ones that produce the noise and buy noise-producing equipment, to attend them by noise zero equipment that's already being made out of recycled plastic when and sold in progressive cities. Um, there's a couple of places cited there. We want the owners of noise to be on the people what are producing the noise. They have one warning. Then with recorded documented that they're making the noise the police can accept. The police are empowered under this new one. God bless their heart. They'd come out under the old one so we can't do anything. But this new one they're empowered to say, you got one warning. The next time they offend, they get fined and arrested, and they get to opt out with a work program of digging dirt and moving so what, dirt. So what we'll do is that we'll have someone to take a look at this and then follow up with you as it relates to this, okay? Well, there were other ordinance changes. Please consider them to, to empower the police with paid, paid paid briefings okay. because you. they're on the job. Thank you. Ms. Mercer, if I can ask just one question. Do you have an email? Yeah. Okay. Hi, you, how are you? you? I love your name. That's right. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Do you know okay, it's Booker I T. Have Washington? It. I have it. I'll get it from, get it from the council. And I, I appreciate it. Thank okay. you so much. Booker T. Washington's middle name. Yes, it is. BDW. Thank you all. Thank you. That concludes public comments. Thank you. Um, confirmation of uh, appointments, consent agenda legislation, introduction. Rick, at this time, we'll move to regular agenda legislation, resolutions on second reading and final passage. Mr. Dog. Good afternoon. Uh, 166 of 2021 has, was postponed, I believe, last time until June 27th. Uh, 46 authorizes the use of uh, some of the city equipment by the North Shreveport Business Association, uh, it's chairs and tables and things like that for their crawfish bowl and their heroes banquet. This, this is something we've done before and I believe this is for allowing for the next three years. 47 authorizes an agreement between the city and the Overton Brooks VA Center. Uh, they're going to put up a couple of water tanks on their property and they need a, some servitudes for us on the property just next to the parkway so we can do that. 49, it's been kind of an adventure. It uh, declares a public emergency in connection with the repair and refurbishment and installation of a roof for hangar number 40. If you've been here long enough, that's the one that was originally built for Rockwell and 
is now, I believe it's got, it's got another aircraft maintenance firm in it now. Uh, in the storm a week or so back, uh, the roof blew off. And fortunately, it's covered almost entirely by insurance, but we need to declare the emergency in order to go ahead and, and, and get people started. Uh, Mr. Blackwell's here from the airport if you have any questions about that one. Uh, 50 authorizes the purchasing agent to re reject all bids for a request on uh, re-roofing re fire station number 20. Uh, they took bids. They were about 40% over the estimate. Uh, SPAR would like to try again in hopes of attracting some more bidders. Uh, 51 recognizes Brian Keith PK, P2K Taylor uh, uh, for his contributions to the music industry. This was sponsored by Councilwoman Taylor. 52 also sponsored by Ms. Taylor recognizes the Shreveport chapter of the Lynx Incorporated for their contributions to the Shreveport community and to celebrate their 50th anniversary. Uh, 53 Rick Selk congratulates the Southern University Lady Jags on being uh, crowned the 2023 SWAC Women's Basketball Tournament Champion. 54 congratulates the LSU uh, women's basketball team for uh, winning their first national championship in school history. And just to remind you that we have a Shreveport connection to that one. Former Fire Chief Bo Roberts' daughter Jennifer is on Kim Mulkey's staff and if you knew where to look in the background, she was on television a lot that weekend. 55 recognizes April 2023 as Sexual Assault Awareness Month in the city. That's sponsored by Councilwoman Taylor and Mr. Boucher. 56 recognizes the AmeriCorps Senior Southern University at Shreveport Caddo Bozier DeSoto Foster Grandparent Volunteer Program. Try that in one, in one breath. Um, they, this is sponsored by the chairman. Um, they've been providing this service uh, since the early 80s, I believe, and, I, and according to the fact sheet, have, there's a luncheon in their honor uh, May the 4th at Billberry Park. Thank you. Any questions on any of these items? Thank you. Introduction of resolutions not to be adopted prior to April 25th, 2023. Mr. Dar. Yes, sir. Uh, we only have one of those. It authorizes a request to be made to the uh, Louisiana Mineral and Energy Board to seek public bids for an oil, gas, and mineral lease involving some property in District D. I believe this is, um, let's, let's see, it's almost 57 acres, again at $3,000 an acre. This is, is basically near the intersection of East Kings Highway and Bagley Road. We own some property down Bagley and the rest of it is street rights away. If, if we do get bids here, it would bring us approximately $171,000. Any questions? Thank you. We'll move to introduction of ordinance not to be adopted prior to April 25th, 2023, Mr. Dart. 36 amends the 2023 capital improvements budget for a couple of airports projects. It creates a $750,000 project to work on the drainage at one of the runways out at Regional Airport and adds $135,000 to another project that uh, improves the terminal apron. Those are all 100% state funded. And most likely before passage in two weeks, we will end up knowing a little bit more about the uh, Roof, emer roof hanger or roof em emergency, and we'll be able to amend uh, to create a project for that. You can kind of probably expect to see that two weeks from now. Uh, 37 amends the 2023 water and sewer budget. It moves $150,000 from their reserve to a, a capital project for their SCADA system and appropriates $154,500 to pay their share of the increase in the insurance premiums that we just. Uh, got for the year that began April 1st. Uh, 38 amends the capital budget to move a little over $7 million between water and sewer projects to fund the city share of the, uh, we told you we got a $5.8 million water sector program grant not too long ago. Well, this is the, the local match for that. It also uh, adds that $150,000 that we talked about in the water and sewer ordinance and, and properly appropriates it. 39 amends the uh, uh, 2023 airports budget. This moves $56,000 from their reserve to pay their part of the insurance. And again, we may very well amend that to uh, properly categorize the, the, the um, roof repair money. The good news is we only have our deductible, I believe is somewhere around $58,000. So that part will have to be moved correctly. The rest of it will just be revenue from insurance proceeds. So it, it could have been a lot worse. Um, let's see, 40 amends the retained risk budget. Uh, this 
aggregates in all the money that's coming in from general fund and from airports and water and sewer over and above what was in the original budget. It's a little over, it's almost a million six fifty. Any questions on any of those items? We'll move to ordinance on second reading and final passage. Okay. Um, Mr. Stewart. Yes, sir. 26 amends the 2023 Sportran budget. Uh, this was postponed last time at Ms. Taylor's request. Um, we have since provided some additional information today that, that was asked for about the funding source that, that's being um, substituted for the general fund money that's going here. And it, it is a 19, early 1980s bond issue that is, probably hasn't had any money spent on it in a good while. Started out at a million dollars, a little over half a million now. And we, we asked about whether it was okay to use it this, for this purpose, and we're, we're told we could. Um, 30 amends so, the. Mr. Mr. Duck, let sorry. me ask you this. Yes, sir. So, on this, so this bond was, was where now? In the early 1980s, there was a million dollar bond proposition called in, Industrial Park Infrastructure. And I think it was just put in there in, in hopes that at some point there would be a use for it. There was a little bit of it used over the years. Uh, 40 years later, there's still a little over $500,000 in it. We are trying to find a way to use that up. And because the BRF area is essentially a medical industrial park, we felt like that was an appropriate way to use it. And since the bonds are paid off, there are a little bit fewer restrictions than there might have been otherwise in doing it. So we have we have that in writing. Where is that it would be okay to use this money? I do not have or, it in writing. I had it in a discussion with Mr. Bowles, who, who has been your financial advisor. Could you ask him to put that in writing so we'll make sure that we're secure before we would vote this? I will see yes if I can get no. it for you tomorrow, and if not, we can we can postpone it again. Okay. Uh, that's fine. And, and Mr. Dart, the 536, what is it being transferred to? Is it going back to just to the general fund? No, sir. It's, it's being transferred. It's part of the Sportran budget includes a good bit of general fund money that's a match for what's called the raise grant. That mm -hmm. is all the work on um, the corridor, basically from Shriners to, to Willis Knight and along Kings Highway. Um, there's about a five, a little over $5 million match for that. And we were trying to find a way to reduce that without changing the project. So this, in effect, substitutes for a little bit of that general fund money. But it doesn't, it doesn't change anything otherwise. So it will not affect the project at all? The, no, the, the project will end up being the same size. It'll just have a slightly different funding mix. It'll have, instead of having 5.3 million general fund, it'll have 4.8 million general fund and the 500 and something thousand. Here, it's the same same project size. All we're doing is modifying the funding source. But I will see if Mr. Bowles can get you that tomorrow. Okay, um, let's see. 30 is the uh, amendment that was introduced last time to the general fund by Ms. Taylor that provides $110,000 to the fire department for a dive boat. 31 also was introduced by Ms. Taylor last time amending the general fund to provide a little over $133,000 for several items of equipment for the police department. 32 amends the general fund budget. Um, we have a, an amendment for that, but before we get there, you know, this is, this is one we, had, we were asked to provide a great deal of uh, supporting information, which we did last week. Um, if there are any questions about it, we'll be glad to. The amendment just changes the, changes the, the money around without changing the total in the mayor's office to reflect the fact that uh, should you confirm me whenever that occurs, I will be an employee and not a contract employee because they're paid out of different accounts. Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, Attorney Tucker, can you step to the podium, please? Good afternoon. So okay. I'm hoping you can answer some questions for me. As chairman of the Audit and Finance Committee, I did receive several communications as it relates to Mr. Dart's current contract. Um, it appears that he has been brought in as a um, professional service contract employee. Um, and if we confirm him, we have been reassured that he will move over to a employee um, um, once confirmed but as of right now the question on the table is does his current contract violates the open bid law did that contract have to go out for open bid based on the amount that is currently being paid 
we wanted to make sure that we're not in violation and if any uh, authorization that he has signed up until this point, we're still covered as a contract employee. I will get that uh, response to you before by the end of the week. Okay. Um, so your question is whether or not his current employment is as a professional service contract employee or whether his current service is as an employee. Correct. Thank you. I have one question. Um, on the uh, contract that Mr. Dark has at this particular time, which one of the, um, I guess, I don't know, maybe it was your assistant city attorney, who drew up the contract is what I'd like to know. Um, I believe Mr. That was early on. Mr. Dark uh, initially uh, sent some um, draft, and I believe that I ended up just uh, drafting up an employment contract. You, you're not for sure. I, I did. I did draft por portions of it. Yes. So in drafting it up, um, with the amount of money that um, we were paying, is it legal for us to do that without having an RFP? I will. That's what I'm going to research for you. It, it was an employment contract. When I drafted it, it was an employment contract, but I will look at the issue that uh, the Councilman Jackson has asked me to look at, and I'll, I'll get back with y'all uh, within the week. On when you issue. say an employer's contract? It's an employment contract. It's okay. my understanding that he was appointed as the interim CAO, and then he needed an employment contract. That was my understanding. Okay. But I will, I will look at that issue for you for sure. And also, if you can... Uh, bring with you maybe an example of that being done before example of what being done before that this type of contract an employment contract within the city of Shreveport anyway oh. okay thank you all right I had questions, questions on, the on police and fire on those particular, um, Mr. Chair? Yes. On those particular changes and wanting to know um, <clears throat> can these dollars be used as some form of incentive for police and fire? That's an issue we've been taking a great deal of, of looking at in the last few months we're not ready to make a recommendation on on it certainly there are plenty of other dollars in, in the police and fire budgets that could be used for, for such even after this passes so again what I'm saying that before this is this something that we can turn around and look at giving everything that we have going on as far as public safety is concerned is this something on these dollars that we can use this almost um, 1.2 million dollars that we can use as far as incentive for fire and police since we're having a problem with retention uh, yeah I'll, I'll answer that one the uh, we are examining what those sources are this do, in our view does not does not foreclose any of those other kinds of ideas which may include bonuses, may include incentives, uh, but this does not, in our view, create any issue in terms of being able to fund whatever it is that we should recommend to you. So where does the $610,000 go? That you'll have to ask Mr. Dark about. Okay, so the 610000 that's coming out of the police budget? Yes. Let's see. Let me be sure here. A lot of pages here. <clears throat> essentially what we did was put together we had a number of things that, that had to be added some of them in fire some of them in general government uh, some of them in other departments and, and in order to have a budget amendment to you that that had a net zero where we didn't hit the reserve there were some reductions re recommended to you from police and fire and spar and essentially unused funding that mostly in, in the case of police was budgeting for health employee health care that was kind of the first quarter money they didn't use um, 
So there's, there's certainly plenty of additional funding there for whatever program might be. You know, our concern has always been trying to find something that works and a number of things that some cities have tried, you know, they seem to be much less comfortable right now that they do work. We've had some, some different suggestions from various folks in the police department and the fire department. We're trying to come up with something to present to you. And whatever that is, there's still plenty of money in the fire and police budgets should you choose to implement them now or whether we should wait until the 2024 budget to do that. that that'll be a policy question down the road. But we're not, we haven't, as Mayor said, we've not done anything in this budget amendment that forecloses it one way or the other. If you chose to take those money out, the, the operating reserve would have a little more money and or, or the police department, or, excuse me, the reserve would have a little less money. The police department would have a little more money, but either way, the, the, the options to you are there no matter whether this were to pass or not. You, you have not foreclosed anything. Police and fire both have enough extra salary money should we choose to use it for that. So to sum it up, Mr. Dart, you're saying this is will go back to prevent us from having to take money from the reserves? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, Chief Wayne, will you mind coming up to the podium for me, please? Is that okay? Evening. Can you speak to me about overtime? I know a lot of your officers work side jobs and um, I've got a lot of calls that say we can use funding to keep them working for SPD if possible. Do you have a lot of guys that are looking for overtime versus working their side job? Because I believe it's a win-win if you have the guys that, that want to work, um, especially if we have the money that's available to pay them. Uh, funding is available uh, for overtime as much as officers want to want to work. Uh, I listen at the radio each and every day, and we have like six different shifts or six times when shifts change. And each time prior to one shift uh, getting off, I hear dispatch come on and say that, uh, for instance, shift C is looking for four, five, six, seven people. I hear it on shift B. I hear it on, on shift uh, A. So there are plenty of opportunities on every shift, and we have money available to pay officers to work <coughs> overtime pretty much as much as they want. Uh, I have never seen an instant uh, where we have refused an officer the opportunity to work extra because of funding. We've always had funding to take care of that. Uh, you folks, each year we budget uh, a certain amount in our budget specifically for overtime for special operations, which you know are taking place now just about uh, every weekend for certain things that are going on around our city. But overtime, paying overtime isn't a, isn't a problem. Thank you. Yes. So, Chief Wayne, on the bus, um, did you get, get a quote on that for us? On the what now? On that security bus. The paddy wagon. Which one? You know, we talked about the bus that was was not working right now. Oh, 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 oh. Yes. Uh, hopefully, it should be back within the next uh, uh, week or, or so. Okay. We're praying and hope that it, that it will. And uh, as I said earlier, thank you all so much for allowing okay. us to uh, the funding to purchase a new one through a bond issue. And even though this one is 25 years old, it's still got a little life in it, and we're going to repurpose it and use it, uh, hopefully, for our community education. You remember how the bookmobile used to work in yes. school? Something yes. similar to that. I think when that bus was on Jewel and Greenwood Road, it put a scare to everybody. So I was looking forward to having it there. This Absolutely. Summer. And uh, that one was a, a, uh, an old sport train bus that we repurposed. Uh, and it still works. You see it at every special event. And uh, we're getting a couple of more people with their CDL driver's license so we can send it out uh, more on weekends and to other places. Thank, Thank you so much Thank for you. that. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Chief, if I may, I, I, obviously this does not necessarily have to do with anything about money on overtime, but um, uh, just as a matter of policy, is, is, do we have any kind of a policy, policy and safety, do we have any kind of a policy that actually says that an officer cannot work 
over a certain number of hours of overtime. Um, I, I, you know, of course, we've, we've had this discussion over the years that we've served together is that how much t overtime is too much for an officer and then we have a safety concern and I was just wondering if we have a policy <laughs> that actually addresses that or we keep track of because you know officers sometimes just never take off that uniform and right. you know unfortunately when they hit the streets going back to their normal shift then they're they're burned out so to I'm my knowledge uh, we do not have a policy that limits an officer from working uh, because it would be extremely hard to regulate that. Uh, we require at the first of every year for an officer to file a report with special events uh, about the extra employment outside of the police department that they're working and get our permission to do so. And uh, most uh, do that. But so far as within the police department, we have as much uh, overtime in a USD capacity as a person want to work. You sure. choose your shift, choose your days. Thank you. What do we have allocated for mental health? Ma'am? What do we have allocated for mental health? We have not uh, affixed a uh, dollar amount to uh, mental health. Uh, Lieutenant Bowman is our person who, who is leading the charge in that direction. And we're constantly meeting with our mental health providers, figuring out uh, ways that the police can get more involved in what it is that they do. But we have not taken on the task of fixing a budget for that. M my donation right now is donating her full time to collaborate with them and to coordinate uh, the training that we need throughout the department so everyone has the same training uh, and everyone has recognized uh, the need for special, special training. And I think that is uh, spreading throughout other law enforcement agencies throughout our community, getting the same training that we're getting. So I know that, um, yes, yeah, she's been tasked with that, has been doing one heck of a job with the agreements and everything that we have with, um, LSU, am I correct, with LSU? And another one of my concerns is the mental health for the officers. Sure. Um, with the amount of shootings that they see, Chief Reese as well, and speak to that with our first responders with the scenes that they go on, what is allocated for gotcha. that? We have several things in place uh, <laughs> beside uh, peer assistance immediately within the ranks. Mm -hmm. Uh, here a while back, over the course of years, the city offered through their employee assistance program uh, through city HR five, I believe, sessions per year per officer, and I think that has been increased to ten. ten. Uh, yes, ten. And uh, our administration is constantly in contact with people that we know of that has gone through some kind of trauma during their duty hours uh, to try to assess the need and make sure that they get whatever it is help they need. And I would not be bashful even if it was something outside of what was allotted to go forth to my bosses and say, you know, I need some extra help for someone who's going through some trauma in their life. <coughs> Mr. Chair, my next question was on the on the lighting because we had five million dollars for interior lighting for the bond, and then there's another request for five hundred thousand. And so my request, my question is still, what is that request for? Since we have the five million dollars for interior lighting for the city of Shreveport, what we, the way we think it it, it can be explained best is that the five hundred thousand we've asked you to put into the budget is for the kind of maintenance things when somebody calls and says there's a pole down, there's an electrical circuit out, the kind of things where, where there's lighting already, but for some reason it doesn't work. The five million was in the bond issue, in our opinion, for, for lights that didn't exist. And so, th those, so those things don't contradict each other. We need both of them. And I know the, the, the report I got today when, when you all asked was that the, the work that's being just about to be started on the Cross Lake Bridge 
was the first big thing out of the five million. And Mr. Norman in, informed me that what he is hoping to do is to sit down individually with you all and to try to get some ideas of places where you think other lighting would be appropriate, uh, would be needed, so we could then begin to, to, to work on those things. But the but the five hundred thousand is when somebody calls and says there's a light out on the interstate, and we find out there's a you know there's a major electrical reason why that's not working, and things have to be worked on. So that's that's where that money is needed. So it's, it's two different things. So the interior lighting is for what is in the city, correct? In our existing districts, it's it's for lighting. It was intended, I think, mostly to be neighborhood lighting or, or big intersection lighting, depending on what you all thought were, was important. This 500000 is for maintenance. Yes, yes, ma'am. And we have a little bit already, and this is just supplementing that because we, we, fe we felt like we were going to run out of that money you know, well before the need ran out this year. Thank you. We're meeting uh, again Thursday, mm -hmm. uh, myself and Mr. Norman and others to discuss uh, the bond portion of it. Uh, I did uh, poll all my officers around the city to identify locations within the city uh, that was out without lights or that needed improvement in lighting that could affect our mission, uh, which is to reduce crime and fear of crime. And so we're working from, from that list. And that was a lot around our city okay. a lot and that was quite a bit uh, to be frankly honest where there was lighting where the lights wasn't working mm -hmm. what's the time frame that we look at mr norman as we get ready to move with the interior lighting in the city i know cross lake bridge has been one that was um has been on the list for quite a bit of time Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, the the Cross Lake Bridge project, which will go all the way from from Lake Shore to the new 49 interchange, mm -hmm. has uh, has already bid, uh, and we have sent the the uh, purchasing has sent the information to the contract. We're waiting for their response back on fair share participation and the paperwork they've got. So we, as soon as we get that back, and uh, I'm pushing it really hard, then we'll we'll start. Uh, you know, we'll get that one processed to get it going. I know that's been an eyesore for a long time, and I'm excited about that. Uh, as far as the 500,000, just kind of add to what uh, Mr. Dark said, is you know, we've been doing most of this is what we're trying to do on the interstates. And I, I think you've seen, a, mm -hmm. uh, you know, hopefully have seen a, a, an improvement on the lights on I-20 and right. I-49 and all, but we're, we're almost out of the money that we had for it. We still got quite a bit of work that needs to be done on it to, to get it back up to a level that we can maintain it. So <clears throat> that's our, our interest there. Um, you know, I do know there are a number of neighborhoods and one of the reasons we want to communicate, uh, you know, with, with you as the council representative for a district is to, you know, there may be neighborhoods that need to be upgraded, the right. lighting does. And we feel like this would be a good, you know, good way to do it. The, the I guess the, the other thing that we don't want to do is that a lot of those lights are maintained by SWEPCO and I don't want, want to, you know, to pay for something that's, uh, you know, that's the responsibility of somebody else to That was to, my to other question. Of. Well, we won't be maintaining Swepco's stuff mm -hmm. since that's theirs. No, ma'am. But I, I do know that, you know, there, there may be some things that we're willing to, to invest in, I think, to, you know, to, to do. And then, uh, you know, uh, along with getting Swepco to upgrade something that we have to pay initial upfront cost or something on. But, uh, but uh, yeah, that I think you know it's something we need to. Okay. It's not. It's, yeah. Can get a little think, bit complicated. <laughs> I don't think you get any argument as far as lighting and lighting the city up. I just yes, wanted to know the specifics of what, where, when the lighting will take place. Where is the lighting going to be, and what is the five hundred thousand dollars for additionally for for lighting. Chief, uh, just if I may, we have any additional updates on cameras? I know that the last meeting, all the cameras that we have are were installed. <coughs> or they're, they're uh, the the ones that were uh, defective have been They've replaced. Been replaced. Uh, last week, uh, 11 camera sets were put up around town, and I think it's about 31 left to go. Those are ones that 
the city of Freeport actually owns, and uh, others are, are signing on. So we're getting there, uh, provided that weather stays good uh, within the next month. <clears throat> if everything goes well, all that we own should be up in locations. Uh, all of the locations that were requested from SWEPCO, uh, all of the polls except 21 have been approved. Uh, and we're meeting, I believe, this week with a SWEPCO representative to work out a contract because the first 50 uh, they took care of after 50, then we'll have to work out an agreement to, you know, pay for utilities. So it's, it's rolling, rolling right along. Uh, as a matter of fact, a good success story, if that's appropriate to say a success story, uh, an event of this past weekend uh, was captured on RTC C camera. So the investigators had something really good to work with. And uh, in due time, uh, we know that more incidents will be captured on camera, but most importantly, more incidents will be prevented. That's our ultimate goal. Oh, and, and, and about the lighting, uh, we've compiled a list, but if you all recognize somewhere in your district that you think uh, doesn't have a light or would benefit from a better light, would you please email that to me and I can make sure this on my list that we evaluate it. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Chief. Yes. Thank you. Mr. Doyle. Yes, sir. Uh, $475,000 from SPAR Personal Services. What, what's, what's, could you give me some insight on that? Yes, sir. Um, one of the things that, that the 2023 budget has in it in some departments is that every position that's ever been authorized ever was fully funded for not only pay but insurance and everything else. And we, we sat down with, with Ms. Regal to see what she thought she actually would be filling for the year and tried to take a little bit of that uh, for, again, to try to find a way to make the, the budget revenue neutral. Um, there's not, we're not taking anything away from what they believe they'll be able to do or any positions they believe they'll be able to fill. But when you've got a, you know, a number of vacancies that have been vacant for a pretty good while and yet they're still fully funded, it does leave a little bit of money to, to remove without doing any harm to the department. If what I, I just look at as far as being so important that is that with all that Ms. them do with kids, that could keep a lot of kids out of trouble. And when I see $475,000 being taken away from them, it just kind of put me uh, a little at ease. So, Dora, can so, Ms. Creel give me an update, too, on the polls, since, since we could not use those polls at Willow Ridge and South Lake Shore for cameras? What is the city doing in reference to that? Since that the, seems to be a major. one intersection. Trying to find some other, some other way to mount some cameras, because Webcom won't let us put them on, on their steel poles. So right. I, I'll get her to get with you. Um, okay. I, she's going to be part of this meeting we're talking about with, with uh, Chief Smith. I think it's tomorrow. I'm not sure. Okay. Jelly, could you come up for a minute? So, Shelly, we, we won't let people know that I'm your favorite council member, but tell me, uh, <laughs> tell me about this 475. What will it do to Sparrow? Uh, just tell me about it. Well, because it's coming out of salaries, it won't affect programming. It may at the end of the year. I mean, we'll see it midterm if there's something, you know, mid-budget. I have That's what Mr. Dark and I talked about, that, you know, I used to, budget a very heavy vacancy rate because we just know when you have that many full and part-time employees you can't keep them all employed we didn't do that over the past two years we we fully funded everything so this just does what we normally would have done which is fill vacancy rates in that mid-year we'll be coming back to you because we'll be looking at utilities we'll be looking at programming and we'll be looking at maintenance dollars 
that we might need. But I think at this point, we're pretty comfortable with this coming out of our 1,000. If it was gonna come out of somewhere like programming, you'd, I'd be up here okay. asking you to do something different. I but I think we're in good shape. I have a question also since you're up. Um, the pool at Bill Cockerell? Yes, ma'am. Did you get the numbers back on that? We do know that um, the repair is about 380000 as you and I talked about. Um, I did reach back out to, we brought an aquatics engineer in to look at all of our pools to make an assessment, somebody that's qualified to look at the pools and tell us their needs. Bill Cockrell has been down two years, so when they came in and looked at it, um, first of all, when they looked at our pools, they couldn't believe them. They're, you know, so don't meet today's standards, they don't meet today's, if we, we couldn't build something like that. Um, we went back to him and talked to him like I told you we would do, and he really feels like it would just be a waste of dollars to put $380,000 into a pool that doesn't meet today's code. So we are pricing some other options, like a spray ground, and then he's given us a price for a new pool. I think pools are going to have to be something, I mean, I guess I can say this out loud, but it's going to be something we're going to have to look at in a bond issue because all of our pools if you look at that report, and I can provide a copy of it to all of you, um, all of our pools are in desperate need of replacement, repairs, major repairs, you know, anywhere. To build a new pool the size of Bill Cockrell is about $880,000. So it's something we're going to, you know, the future of pools needs to be addressed. Okay. So the $380,000, you are saying if we spend that on, it wouldn't last long is what you're saying? He still um, says it needs to be replaced. Right. And he, well, we went back and said, if we spend it, and he was, he said, I, could, I can't hardly recommend that because you're throwing away a lot of money into something that's still going to, it's not going to meet. You're not doing anything but repairing the shell and repairing the equipment. You're not fixing the anything else, and you're not meeting code. Okay. So. It does seem like a lot of money. But for the kids in that community, that pool means a lot. Mm -hmm. And it could keep one kid out of trouble, which right. for a parent, that means a lot. Um, our article did come out about the pool would be out again for the third year. And I did receive a lot of phone calls. Mm -hmm. um, before the article came out, I hadn't received that many. But I have received a lot from Thursday until today. Okay. So it might be something we need to revisit and see exactly what we can do to help. Because that community does have a lot of kids there. We can, we can certainly look at it. I think there's still some funding in the project. It's not enough to do the pool itself. Um, and maybe we take that money. I know we talked about a large spray park there, mm -hmm. if that would be an option. And I think that's something we ought to talk to the community about. Okay. Mr. Dark, can you help us with some money with that? We talked about it this morning. I mean, I obviously haven't seen the, the final numbers, but it sounds like a reasonable approach, assuming you know it's it's the general range we're talking about. And if it turned out that she found out that, that we could do something like that, we we certainly do our best to work with you. I don't I don't think it's out of range at all. Okay, thank you, Shelly. Yes, what are we going to do with the spray park along the riverfront? It is out. <laughs> it is either at purchasing or about to be at purchasing. Okay, for bidding. Okay. You know, I think um, what has happened there. As you know, it flooded in 2015. Right. There is new technology that we didn't have in 2015. So they came to, we brought the company back in to look at the splash pads to evaluate them again one more time. And they said, hey, there's all this new technology. Um, we can make it, it's still going to be underground. You're going to have to do some mitigation when you have flooding. But there are different technology that won't be as expensive to mitigate against flooding and it won't be as expensive to operate and maintain so we're very excited about it and it's out for bid right well, either out for bid or at purchasing to be bid so it goes out for bid what are we looking at next summer not this summer but next we summer. could have them on you know wouldn't be too much fun to play in them we usually turn everything off on the riverfront right before maybe sometimes right after independence bowl it works out mm -hmm. the weather hasn't been too cold wasn't this year right. but um in the future um, but it would be on, but maybe not playable till next summer. It okay. takes 30 days to bid, about 30 days to contract, and then they'll have to come and do the work so, through the summer. But it is kind of an exciting thought that we may get those back on finally. 
those are a big deal to our community. I know the last thing was about the, the lake, with the lake being high, and some of the concerns that I had from constituents were, when I talked to Chief Smith um, this morning, um, was about those individuals out on their boats and the waves coming into their homes. And I know um, we have that zone that is right there by the pier, but I don't think there's anything that we can do to manage those that get on the boat from their personal pier. Right. We did talk about that today in staff meeting. I brought up because you and I had talked early mm -hmm. this morning about it and made sure that the gates were still locked and we, we assume those are people who live on the lake or mm -hmm. getting their boats out, maybe not even in the city limits, outside the city limits. But if there was something we could do to expand the wake zone or mm -hmm. during times the lake times is... times like this? Mm -hmm. yeah. I think Zelda look, you know, was going to look into okay. it too and the chief, we're all looking at it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Schiller. <coughs> yes. You ready? Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, 33 amends the streets special revenue fund budget. This provides an additional $12 million, um, nine and a half from the general fund, two and a half from a little bit additional, additional revenue and from uh, taking up the reserve that was in the streets fund to be used for uh, the streets that had been long promised. We we're hoping that We'll be fortunate on bids and we'll be able to do the list we gave you and we will keep you up as, as the year goes as to whether we've done better or worse. But this is the way to, to, to get us most of the way there. Mr. Chair. Yes. And Mr. Dart, the list that was provided to council, is that still the most updated and final list? I know yeah. several council members had some concerns. So before I, you know, speak on it with anybody of my district, I want to make sure that is the final at, list. At this point, that is the, the correct list. Yes, sir. Thank you. Mr. Dark, if I may, do we have any updates on our position with uh, Ford Street? Yes. Uh, don't do know we? if it's back from water and sewer here. I can find out and get you an answer tomorrow if it's not. Yes, you do. Um, they should, our department, the city has, and met in all of the requirements for the gas lines and the rerouting, so we should be looking at a point of uh, uh, possibly going out for bid for the repairs that we yeah. would need to do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. You're welcome. 34 amends the um, capital improvements budget, and what this does is, is to put the 12 million that's about to come in there from the streets fund into the capital budget and fix one small error that was made in, the, in an amendment some time ago that doesn't change anything other than just make it, make it fit to where it's supposed to. 35 amends the riverfront budget. We are reducing $750,000 that we were budgeted to, to receive from, uh, from the riverfront fund to the general fund. Uh, half a million of that's going into reserve because casino revenues tend to be a little bit unpredictable and trying to be a little bit conservative there. The other 250,000 goes to pay the uh, consulting work that we'll be having done on, on the Amtrak and on the fairgrounds project. So how much each one will get? I believe the Amtrak one was, I believe 83 maybe. 82, 83, something like that. The uh, the, the first estimate on the um, the um, riverfront, uh, excuse me, on the fairgrounds one was between 100 and 150. That leaves us a little contingency for either one of those, you know, having some additional needs, but not a lot. It just leaves us a little bit of, of contingency money there. Okay. Any other questions? I have one. Yes. Mr. Dark, I'm, we want to go back on the streets real fast. I'm sorry. Yes. Once we find money that you allocate for special projects, how do you determine what streets you do in what district and who gets what? Um, it's been a lot of discussion, so I'm going to put the big elephant up there. You're talking about going forward, or how did the list that's. that's how, how was that list accumulated? Was it something Mr. Furlong gave you? Um, it's a computer system that the city has. Yeah. When, when, when we got here in January, December, one of the first things I saw was, was a list that included the streets that had been requested over the last several years that had not yet been funded. And we tried to, to fund as many of those as we could. And the ones that we couldn't fund mostly ended up being the kind of arterials that we're going to get 80% funding for, but you have to wait on the state requirements to do so. We couldn't have done them this year anyway. So we tried to do that. Um, going forward, we will have a much more formal process with each of you to try to determine what the highest priorities are, uh, 
our biggest issue going forward, truthfully, is that we've, we've used up a good bit of the, the backlog money and there may not be nearly as much next year. So the priority setting process will be even more you know, important and, and our pledge to you is that we'll do that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Table legislation, any legislation be taken off the table? No. Um, property standards appeal, alcohol, none. Uh, reports from officers, boards, and committees. Is there a clerk's report? Not at this time. Additional communications. Any commission? M Mr. Mayor, you have any additional communications? I do not, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Any council members have any com uh, additional communication? Visit the Amazon plant on um, last Thursday. It's a beautiful facility scheduled to open in 2024. Um, I won't be asking them what's the delay if you when the plant is open you would see just how technical the plant is and it is uh, imperative that they make sure that they have every I dotted and every T cross um, the starting salary would be $16 an hour with benefits starting on day one after 90 days um, if I'm not mistaken they will pay 100% of college tuition with in-demand uh, jobs. But um, the facility itself is something amazing. It will not be that type of facility that where you will get your packages delivered the same day. We haven't moved to that level yet. Um, however, um, it's a 24-hour operation, um, and we are pretty excited about Amazon being in our, in our neck of the woods. Councilwoman Taylor, are they hiring locally? Yes. But it's not now, not right now. I can't apply. No. Can you let me know? Yeah, we. Thank you. I really do hope that, that each of you at some point get to go through there before they open, because the it's mayor amazing. and Ms. Taylor were there, and it it is an amazing it's place. Amazing place. You know, there. You know, you, you, when you get your phone update, they'll say you're on version 16 or whatever. Mm -hmm. They told us that this warehouse is version 11. Yes. That they keep updating it every time they do it and try to get it better every time, but. It is. It is an. It's. It's like going into another world. How, yes. how do we go by getting a, a tour? We have to wait until they have coming closer to the opening date. So how did y'all do it? And because yeah. it's my district. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just. Saying, I didn't know. I'm just, I was just asking. Well, we'll I you know. That go. <laughs> 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 well, just do my sugar in that water. Yes. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, executive session none. Mr. Chair, yes. you may just want to call a meeting at the Amazon plant. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> Thank you. If nothing, else, if nothing else, we're at you. <laughs>